Welcome to this presentation on location-aware communications for 5G networks. My name is Henk Weimers and I'm with the Department of Signals and Systems at Chalmers University of Technology. This presentation is based on a joint paper with Srikar Mupirisetti, Rocco di Toronto, Tommy Svensson, all from Chalmers, and Dirk Slock from Uricom, as well as Ronald Ralefs from DLR in Germany. While 5G is not formally specified yet, we can already describe it through some of its characteristics. According to the METIS project, 5G will be characterized by an avalanche of traffic, an explosion of the number of connected devices, and a large variety of use cases, some requiring high data rates, others low data rates, but perhaps very low latency. This idea of low latency was also taken up by Gerhard Fettweiss in his concept of the tactile internet, which considers wireless control applications with response times on the order of a millisecond, which is over one order of magnitude better than what we can do today. In this picture, taken from NSN, we see the evolution of data growth rate as a function of time, along with signaling overhead growth rate over the same time. Just looking at the slope of those two curves, we see that at some point, signaling overhead will be dominant, which is obviously not what we want. And finally, an important challenge in 5G will be the issue of scalability. As thousands of devices want to connect with each other in a small area. To address the challenges posed by 5G, a number, a number of new technologies are being proposed, such as massive MIMO, beamforming, or moving to very high frequencies. In this presentation, we consider a complementary approach, namely location awareness. This is the outline of this presentation. I will start by defining what is location-aware communication and how location awareness is enabled through new navigation technologies. I will then describe what we call a channel quality metric prediction engine, which is a technique to predict the channel quality in a new location or at a new time. Then I will describe how location awareness can be used across a protocol stack. Finally, I end with some conclusions and research challenges. Considering very basic wireless communication models, there are some obvious connections between location and communication. First of all, path loss, which depends on distance. So as a mobile moves further away from a base station, the receive power will drop. This reveals a connection between position and power. Secondly, shadowing, which exhibits spatial correlation. As the user moves, the shadowing decorrelates according to certain models, such as here the Goodmanson model. Interference. It is well known that a certain time frequency resource can be reused when transmitter and receiver pairs are sufficiently far away. This idea of spatial reuse again relies on positions of nodes and ties them then to interference levels or useful power levels. Propagation delay. If we know the position of a transmitter and a receiver, we know how long it will take for a signal to travel over the air between that transmitter and receiver. And this information can then be used, for instance, for synchronization. But again, there is a connection between the positions of the nodes and a communication-related parameter, namely the propagation delay. Similarly, we have the Doppler. When a mobile moves away from the base station, its velocity can then be related to the Doppler shift, which often needs to be estimated in communication systems. In a multi-antenna system, under some conditions, the channel can be predicted if the angle of arrival between the user and the base station is known. So again, the position of the users reveals something about the channel which in turn affects the communication. 
In a wireless network, where there's a dense deployment of nodes, and we want to perform routing from a source to a destination, the minimum hop path also follows the minimum Euclidean distance. This idea is exploited, for instance, in geo-routing. So the positions, again, can be used to improve routing. Finally, there is a less obvious connection between location and communication, which is related to our day-to-day -day behavior, which is largely predictable. So if I'm in a tram on a certain time going to work, I will probably be in the same tram the next day. And this information can then be used to do proactive resource allocation, or for instance to preload video content to base stations if it is known that I'll very likely request that data at a certain time in a certain place. These eight examples serve to illustrate that there is a close connection between location and communication. A question that now pops up is what kind of accuracy can we expect from future location technologies? Once we know this accuracy, we can then think of ways how to exploit the location information for communication. It is expected but that by 2020, we should be able to have one meter accuracy everywhere. Outdoors, through a variety of GNSS systems, and indoors to dedicated technologies such as ultra-wideband. The user equipment can infuse all these technologies in an optimal manner to obtain one meter accuracy. Now, what can we do with this one meter accuracy? Ticking back to basic wireless communication, we know that the wireless communication channel comprises a number of components. There is a large scale fading, comprising path loss and shadowing, which is correlated over multiple meters. There is also small scale fading due to multipath, which, depending on the carrier frequency, is correlated over very short distances. So if you have one meter accuracy, we can only predict the large scale fading, but not the small scale fading. This then leads to two complementary approaches to perform resource allocation for wireless communication. There is a traditional pilot based prediction of the channel or a channel quality metric, such as power or interference level, over very short time and length scales. This approach can then be complemented with a location-aware prediction of the channel quality metric over much longer time and length scales. Of course, the channel is affected by a wide range of sources of uncertainty. So in order to predict the channel, we need a powerful statistical engine. The statistical engine would operate as shown on the right. Users would upload their received signal strength to a base station along, a, along with their position and a timestamp to the database. The predictive engine can then predict the received signal strength for a user in a new position at a new time. and This information can be requested by the base station and then utilized to perform resource allocation. The predictive engine should be adaptive since the channel can change dramatically between an indoor and outdoor environment or an urban and a rural environment. It should be mixed parametric and non-parametric, meaning that it can include models as well as measurement data, and it should provide confidence levels or indications of uncertainty. The approach that we consider in this presentation is the one of Gaussian processes. This is a well-known book in the area of Gaussian processes. To illustrate how these work, consider on the left side, on the x-axis, the position here in one dimension, and on the y-axis, the received signal strength. If no measurements are taken, then the different lines represent different realizations of the received signal strength that could occur, and the gray area reflects the uncertainty. So without measurements, we have basically no idea what the received signal strength will be. Now in the middle figure, marked as posterior, we have a number of measurements available, denoted by black crosses. 
In these measurement locations, we have measured the received signal strength. So there is very little uncertainty. In other locations, nearby the measurement locations, we also have low uncertainty because of the correlation and the shadowing. At locations very far away from measurement locations, we still have an estimate of the received signal strength, but also a very high uncertainty. In this figure, we illustrate this in more detail. This is a top-down view of the received signal strength from a base station, which is placed in the middle. The white crosses represent measurement locations where users have measured the received signal strength and then sent this to the database. From this database, the Gaussian process can then predict what the received signal strength will be in any other location. This prediction is shown on the top right. And we see that it, measure, that it matches the true field quite well. In addition, the Gaussian process gives a measure of uncertainty. This is shown in the bottom right. We see that in the measurement locations, the uncertainty is very low. This is shown in blue. In locations far away from measurement locations, the color changes to orange and red, indicating that there is very high uncertainty. Now that we have an understanding of how this database works, we can now leverage this information to perform location-aware resource allocation across a protocol stack. We will start with the physical layer. In the physical layer, the database can be used to predict the channel or as a channel prior. Alternatively, the position can be related to physical waveform parameters. This includes propagation delay and Doppler shifts. Overall, this will bring benefits in terms of reducing signaling overhead, and this will be especially useful when there are feedback delays. In this slide, we show a number of existing works where location information is used in the physical layer. I have underlined certain words which relate to 5G. Traditionally, location information was used in the, concept, in the context of cognitive radio. However, this is not the only way that location information can be used. I did not plan to go over each of these contributions, but focus just on one of them. This paper considers the problem of location-aware rate adaptation. There is again a database, but in this paper there is no uncertainty in this database. So all the information is perfectly accurate. The mobile reports a navigation path that it will traverse in the future to the base station. This information is passed over a delayed feedback channel. The base station can then allocate resources to communicate with the mobile. The resources are allocated based on a channel capacity equation. The paper considers a line of sight capacity and a non-line of sight capacity. It will then select a rate based on the expected capacity. This rate can then be supported if the capacity is higher than the selected rate or the link will be in outage when the selected rate is too high. This figure shows the performance for a number of communication strategies. On the x-axis we have the normalized feedback delay so on the left hand side is very low feedback delay, on the right hand side very large feedback delay. On the y-axis a measure of the average rate. In this figure there are essentially three communication schemes. The horizontal line here at around 4.5 bits per second per hertz corresponds to a fixed modulation encoding scheme, so one that does not adapt to the instantaneous channel. Then there is a line that starts from a high value and then quickly drops. This is a traditional rate allocation based on the channel state information. And we see that when the delay in the feedback channel is large, the channel state information available to the base station is outdated and there will be significant outages leading to an overall reduction in rate. Finally, we have a number of curves that are more or less horizontal at a high rate and those correspond to the location-aware resource allocation. So in this case, the base station has knowledge of the predicted path 
of the mobile and I can use this information in combination with the database to allocate resources. And in this case, there is no significant degradation even when the feedback delay is large. We now move up to the medium access control layer. In the medium access control layer, the location information can be used in more or less the same way as in the physical layer and it has its benefits to make the Mac faster, more scalable and with less signaling overhead. Again, a number of existing works can be found in this area. And as before, underlying words relate to 5G. We focus on one specific application, namely interference coordination. In this work, the authors consider a scenario with macro base stations and femto base stations. A user would install a femto base station, and this femto base station would report its position to the macro base station. Then this information is sent to the database. Based on the database, the macro base station would inform the femto base station which transmit power it should use. The transmit power should be designed in such a way that on the one hand it can serve the femto base stations, and on the other hand it does not interfere too much with the macro users. One of the findings of this paper was that in order for this strategy to work well, one needs to have good position information regarding the femto base station. Here we show some numerical results taken from this paper. On the y-axis, you again have a measure of rate, this time for the femto users. And we assume that the system is designed in such a way that when power is assigned to the femto base station, it can affect the macro users up to only 10% of their rate. The blue line at the bottom is when there is no interference coordination. The horizontal lines, the red dashed lines, correspond to interference coordination based on the power measurements. So these values do not depend on the uncertainty of the femto base station. The full red line corresponds to location aided power allocation as a function of the location uncertainty of the base station. And we see that there are some performance gains when the location information of the base station is quite accurate, within 20 meters or so. When the location information is less accurate, then the performance quickly degrades. We see that with our vision of a 1 meter accuracy, we should be able to leverage the location information for this scenario. More information about this can be found in the paper shown at the bottom left. We now move up to the network and transport layers. Here the location information can be used to find paths between a source and a destination in a large network. And as before, we can use the, data the database to predict the channel. This helps us to find routes faster, to be more scalable, and then to combine routing with rate optimization. Not surprisingly, there's a large literature on geo-routing, and geo-routing has been shown to be quite sensitive to position uncertainty. Geo-routing can also be combined with network utility maximization, which is the paper that we'll discuss next. We consider a scenario with a large number of nodes. In order to perform network utility maximization, we need to collect the channel state information between each pair of nodes, and this scales roughly as order of n squared. Based on this information, we can then assign a route or multiple routes from source to destination, along with power for each of the links. Here we consider location-based optimization, where instead of sending n-squared channel state information 
we send end positions to the central controller, which then determines power and routes. The optimization problem is given here. So we maximize a function of the rate. There's a penalty for power. Important in this constraints here is the fact that the rate over a certain link should not exceed the capacity of that link. The capacity of the link depends on the power allocated to that link as well as the channel. This channel, in our case, is obtained through position information. We considered a simple scenario where the channel is modeled as comprising only path loss. Then we investigate the sensitivity to various levels of shadowing. Of course, since there is a mismatch between the true channel and the channel predicted by the database, there needs to be some adaptation of the links. Since only a small number of links will be active when routing information from source to destination, this can be done quite efficiently. On this figure, we show as a function of the shadowing variance, so as a function of the mismatch between the true channel and the predicted channel in the database, the flow from source to destination. The blue curve with the stars is traditional channel state information based network utility maximization. But again, this scales poorly in the number of nodes. The red horizontal line corresponds to geo routing. This line can be brought arbitrarily close to zero by introducing weak links in the network. The black line corresponds to the proposed technique where we solve the position-based network utility maximization and then do a distributed adaptation to the true channel conditions. We see, as expected, that when there is more mismatch in the channel, the performance degrades. Finally, we consider the higher layers. Here, we can leverage the tight coupling between location information and a specific application. As we will see, there's a large number of applications we can consider and the requirements will be very application dependent. The applications range from traditional context awareness over media streaming with proactive caching, vehicular communication systems, also security, and finally mobile cyber physical systems. Again, we focus only on one contribution. Here the problem is for a number of robots to visit a number of goal locations. To solve this type of problem, we need a close interaction between control, sensor fusion and communication. Again, we have the database containing the channel. The robots solve an optimization problem in order to move to their goal locations. In this work, there was an additional communication constraint, such that each robot, when it moves towards its goal, it maintains connectivity with other robots. This connectivity is dependent on a certain minimum rate. This is one of the results from this work. On the x-axis, you show we show the number of robots. On the y-axis, the time needed to visit all the locations. And the different curves correspond to the minimum rate requirement. And we see that when a high rate is needed, it typically takes more time to visit the locations. This is because the robots need to be clustered together when visiting the locations. When a low rate is fine, the robots can be more aggressive and visit the locations faster. This type of work, again, reveals the connection between different fields from control, sensor fusion and communication. We now highlight a number of remaining challenges. First of all, to achieve the location awareness with the accuracy of one meter is not obvious. While by 2020, Galileo will be online, and multi-frequency receivers will be available, there is still a lot of research to be done in order to 
achieved a 1 meter accuracy. Secondly, how to maintain and construct a database when there is no central controller, such as for ad hoc networks, here shown as a vehicular network, is not obvious. It requires special techniques. The extension of the database to deal with non-stationarity of wireless channels also requires further study. In addition, the database becomes very hard to manage when it gets very large and sparsifying techniques are needed. In the beginning of this presentation, we considered the complementary use of pilot information and position information to perform resource allocation. However, additional research is needed to understand exactly when to use which and what the benefits are of each of the techniques. And finally, the use of location information poses significant challenges for security and privacy. Signal processing can help to address some of these challenges. In conclusion, we have provided an overview of some of the key challenges in 5G networks, including latency, overhead and scalability. There are a number of ongoing research efforts to deal with these challenges, and we believe that location information can help as a complement to these other techniques. There are already existing contributions across the protocol stack of how location information can be used to deal with latency, overhead and scalability. However, the real-world benefits are yet unclear. And there are still a whole list of remaining challenges. This presentation was based on a paper that will appear in Signal Processing Magazine, shown at the bottom of this slide. Thank you for your attention.